So you came back to Cleveland in the late 1970s, and you worked for George Ford. It was Forbes. really the early 1970s. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you came back to Cleveland, mm -hmm. and you worked with George Forbes. Um, tell us about George Forbes, and tell us about the Cleveland of that period, and the period maybe even going into the 1980s. Well, as I think back, your, your questions are really beginning to... Uh, make me think about the files in my brain of those times, but as I look back, it was really kind of a, some people might say eclectic, other people might say strange uh, career that I was developing. Here's this young person, I was 22, I think. I had, you know, been a, a, a guest in the Columbus uh, city jails during the riots. Uh, I later ended up working for a think tank and was lured away by the think tank by Tom Moody, who was a Republican mayor of Columbus, not working in a department, but I actually worked in his office. He wanted me to write some material for him about how to uh, reclaim urban neighborhoods. And I must say very quickly that uh, when I think about the gate posts of my life, I think most people have gate post experiences that they carry with them. I've told you about Carl Stokes, but in a, in a, in a, in a unique way, Tom Moody was one of those gateposts. The complete opposite of Carl Stokes. I mean, here's a man who ran for re-election and his slogan was quietly effective. Well, you know, I'm from Cleveland. You know, the only reason a person would use that slogan in Cleveland is if they're getting ready to retire because they're not going to win with it. But in Columbus, in his time and in his manner, it served him very well. So I learned from him a lot about quiet and effective service. Uh, I learned about uh, not being afraid. I mean, here's uh, this middle-aged man who's the mayor of Columbus. He not just hires this bearded, crazy kid uh, from Cleveland, but he puts him in his office, much to the chagrin of some of his colleagues. And when he asked me to come work for him, and, and I will be very honest with you, I actually... I actually blessed him out a couple times when I was student body president on the 6 o'clock news. Uh, and a few of the words were bleeped out. And I said, here's a man who's had this experience with me, but for some reason, through it all, has read these, these papers I wrote in, in graduate school, and he wants me to finish them and operationalize them. And I said to myself, and this was, frankly, Michael, it was a, it was a very important moment in my life. I said, if this man has the courage to want me to work for him, I'm not only going to say yes, but I'm going to make sure he is never, ever embarrassed by anything I ever do. And that every moment, anything involving me, he's always going to be prepared and ready. And it was in that experience that I learned about the responsibilities of followership and service to a principal. I'd been a leader. I'd been a wallflower and a leader. Now I was serving a principal. And for those couple years... Uh, I learned a great deal about that. So I'm sitting in my office in Columbus, knew I was going to return home one day because after all, I can't be mayor of Cleveland living in Columbus. I get this phone call. Uh, and he, I know he'll be upset, but he actually sounded like Darth Vader. I, he just, hey, this is George Forbes. And he went on and on. He says, Congressman Stokes is running for re-election and we want you to come and run his campaign. And I like to, and we talk. He says, "I'd like to know when you can be there." I said, "I can be there in two weeks." I had to give the mayor two week notice. I never asked how much money I would make. I never asked where my office was. I never asked if there was a problem in the election. I mean, after you all, you're trying to hire a 22, 23 year old kid to run a congressional campaign. I just said I would be there. And uh, Michael, I packed up everything I owned in a big yellow U-Haul truck, including. Uh, a 1972 Datsun Z was my, my, my baby, so to speak. I have an eye uh, perception issue, so I've always been afraid and it's problematic for me to tow things. So I actually pulled this car up into the U-Haul and put all of my worldly possessions around it. I drive this U-Haul back to Glenville to where my parents were, and I back the U-Haul up into my parents' driveway. My father was at work. I told you I have a depth perception. I ran into the 
gutter of the house and the roof. I probably chopped a piece off that large and cracked this concrete. Now you think I would be out of the truck trying to figure out how I was going to not be crucified by my father. I've cracked his sidewalk, I've broken his roof and his gutter, but thankfully he wasn't home. Car pulls up, I hop out of the truck, I hop in the car, I actually go to work for the next 13 hours um, uh, you know, at the campaign. And it was really still a formative thing. I had to open offices and so forth. But I want to just take one minute and tell you about my first meeting. This is the honest truth. Now, I've managed a lot of campaigns. But my first meeting as a campaign manager in 1973 was with State Representative John D. Thompson. I'm, I don't think his family will get angry with me. And uh, there's, only a, there's only a desk and two chairs in the campaign office on Lee Road. He walks in early in the morning. I'm sitting there alone. I don't even think I had a pad of paper. He comes in. He introduces himself. It's early in the morning. I really didn't know who John Thompson was. I really didn't know much about what a state representative was. He says, I'm John D. Thompson. He was just dressed to the nines. He was just, just very well dressed. And I'm sitting there just like you're sitting there. And he puts his briefcase down. He opens his briefcase up after he introduces me to the neighborhood and tells me what's going on and how we're going to beat this kid who's running against a congressman. And then he opens his briefcase up. And I, I assure you, this sounds so strange to be unbelievable, but this really happened. I'm 23 years old. He takes out two glasses. And then he pulls out a bottle of vodka. And he fills each little glass. And he says, to the campaign and to victory. And we sat there about 10 in the morning <laughs> drinking this vodka. That was my introduction to uh, Cleveland politics. And we went on to win. Um, but it was the first time that I had run a campaign for someone else. You know, I had, you know, I had been involved in my own campaign. I was kind of a candidate and a campaign manager. But uh, here, I, Lou Stokes became my principal. We won. Everybody was happy. Uh, there was a possibility that I could go to Washington, which I really didn't want to do. So I ended up going to work for uh, the council president, Cleveland City Council, George Forbes. And uh, he is another gate post in my life. And he's one of, you know, I put him right along uh, uh, Carl Stokes and Tom Moody because I learned a lot from him. And uh, with all due Deference. I learned a lot of what to do and a lot of what not to do. But uh, he's a strong leader. He knew uh, how to wield power. He knew how to wield power on behalf of those people who didn't have power. And he was kind of a mix of, uh, of uh, Dr. King and Boss Tweed all rolled into one. So I learned a lot. And, uh, but I still wanted to be Mayor of Cleveland. <laughs> And so after about uh, a year and a half, maybe two years, I thought it was my time because, you know, you just can't, you know, you're in your 20s, you just don't have a press conference to say, I want to be mayor of Cleveland. Nobody's going to elect you. So I believed you kind of work your way up. So I thought the next step that I should take would be to uh, run for city council. And why not run in my ward in Glenville? Uh, an icon in my community who had been councilman was Leo Jackson. He, uh, he's another gate post in my life. He, more from afar, he taught me a lot. And there was one crucial moment in my life. He gave me some extremely good advice that, quite frankly, about two dozen people had given me the same advice, but it was his advice that was the tipping point. So I decided I was going to run for council, but the problem was there wasn't a vacancy in Glenville, which meant I had to run against this sitting council person in Glenville, which was an ally of George's. I actually walked into his office one day. You know, George is very tall. I walked into his office one day, and he, I said, Mr. President, I, I want to come and see you because I want to let you know that I'm going to run for councilman in Ward 24. I plan on running against Mildred Madison, and I'm going to beat her. And he was just so quiet. And he's very tall, as you know, and so he was quiet, and he leaned back in his chair, and the way his office was set up, you can see Lake Erie behind him. And then in his own kind of subtle, quiet, kind, fatherly way, he leaned forward and he said, well, you've got to get the hell out of here right now. I said, okay. I got up 
I went to my office, which was right across from his. I packed up everything I had. And then uh, I went home. And I ran for election from April to November. I lost 21 pounds in the process. But I beat Mildred Madison. And I beat Mildred Madison with George Forbes doing everything he could to defeat me. And he couldn't. And so at that moment, I hope I'm not boring you too badly, but at that moment, the battle lines were really drawn. Uh, Cleveland politics is not for the faint of heart. If you have a bad heart, you should not be in Cleveland politics. If you are squeamish at uh, bad situations occurring, you should not be in Cleveland politics. If you don't, if you can't push through really horrible things happening to you and wake up the next morning like it's a walk in the park, you should not be in Cleveland politics. And so it was a very hard campaign. I remember one time, Michael, and I wasn't, la I wasn't smiling then, but I can smile now. Throughout the whole campaign, we would sell barbecue chicken and ribs. You know, you're in the black community, you're going to sell barbecue chicken and ribs. We did car washes. We sold T-shirts because nobody would give me money. I actually got one donation of $1,000. Oh, God, you would have thought somebody gave me a million dollars. I went right out, and I bought all these elect Mike White signs. I actually have the last one on earth sitting in my garage. And uh, we went out. We diligently put them up during the week. So now Saturday has come. My thousand dollars worth of signs are up on all these houses. I'm just so proud of myself. You know, we have all these signs. You know, Mildred Madison, I think she's printing them in the basement. They had so many, but we had our thousand dollars worth of signs. About 1030, we're sitting in the campaign office. And I must tell you just very quickly, it gives it a, it gives our first campaign office a lot of credit to call it a campaign office because the building leaned to the left. There were about six or seven holes in the walls. You could actually sit and look and see outside. Little holes. And then when it rained, we had nine buckets because the roof leaked. But it was $100 a month. So I'm sitting in the office about 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. And the phone started ringing. I mean, just ringing and ringing. Oh, he came up on my on my porch and took my sign down. He, you know, another ring. He came up on my porch and he ripped my sign down. These are going on and on. So we hop in the car. We ride out into the neighborhood. And sure enough, uh, George Forbes and my dear friend Paul Wells had unleashed the garbage workers on me. And in those days, these things happened. I don't think they happen anymore, but they were dispatched to go through the entire neighborhood on their own time and rip down every sign. Now, I want you to understand, Michael, they didn't walk up to your house and say, you know, sir, may I take your Mike White sign down? They would walk up to your house, they would rip it down, they would tear it in half, and they would look at you, and their look said, and don't put another one up. <laughs> but we beat Mildred. So the lines were drawn. So, you know, uh, it's interesting we're having this chat because it, it does give you a little perspective. So the night of the of the victory, we're in our little rickety campaign. It's packed. Everybody's there. And uh, none of my elders that I had met working for George ever supported me. Not one. But I understand it's generational. And so the people are chanting. I'm getting ready to get up and give my... Mildred has now uh, given her concession speech. I get ready to get up and give my acceptance speech. And there's a little stage. And sitting right on the corner of the little stage, and I remember this, Michael, like it was yesterday. There's a woman, and I, I, I'm going to give in to my age for a moment because I can't remember her, her full name. I, I know we never called her by her first name. We always called her Mrs. That's a show of respect. She was Lou Stokes's. She... She oversaw the 21st Congressional District Caucus. She was in charge of it. There was no way she was going to be at that. At, she was not there because she took a wrong turn. She was there for only one reason. That's because the congressman and his peers felt it was important to have somebody there that night, no matter how bad it was. And they knew they couldn't come. So they sent uh, this woman who I deeply respected. I treated her like my grandmother. And I'm getting ready to go up on the stage. And she grabbed my shirt 
And she pulled me down and she whispered in my ear. She said either Michael or baby. I can't remember which one. Well, let's say it sounds better if you say baby. So she says, baby, sometimes you have to take low to get high. And she let me go. And she sat right there. Between the time she pulled my shirt to the time I got up on that stage, half of my heat had dissipated. Now, notice I said half. I, I still, you know, was not going to, I wasn't going to, I wasn't ready to turn the other cheek, but I toned it down a little bit. But it was enough for people to feel satisfied. So the, the, the night of the swearing in, I get sworn in on, I think, January 2nd, 1978. I'm 26 years old. Michael, the entire city council chamber is packed. That was one of the years where 13 new councilmen came in, but my race was one of the most hotly debated races. And it was one out in one with a fellow named Terrence Copeland. was another hotly, was a generational change race. These are all generational changes, going from people in my father's generation to people in my generation. Those are hard, those are hard uh, campaigns because you're turning over. The, it's not just your mantle leadership, it's your generation's mantle leadership. And so every seat was taken. People were lining the walls because this was going to be better than the thriller in Manila. <laughs> Mike White and George Forbes. Mike's going to get him for what he did. My mother was there. It was the only time my entire life she was in the Cleveland City Council chambers. And she was sitting next to me. And I will tell you as an aside, the council president dictates where you sit in city council. He had already selected my seat for me. He put me between the oldest two members of the Cleveland City Council. Jimmy Bell and Mary Zone. Both old enough to be my grandparents. But they were very wise. Um, and they were both allies of George. <laughs> so my mother's sitting there, I'm sitting there, and everybody gives their speeches. You give them alphabetically. So I was a W, I was last. So everybody waited. And so when they got to me, I stood up, and I can tell you, it was like a cemetery. Not one person said a word. And I got up, and I gave a speech about why I ran for city council. I gave a speech about why I wanted to sit in city council. And I gave a speech about what I wanted to do for the people that I represented. And I never said once that I'm here to cut George Forbes' head off, which a lot of people wanted me to say. <laughs> and although I didn't think deeply about it, it's kind of what I believed and kind of how I wanted to, you know, it's easy to fight. It's much harder to make peace. Uh, when I was done, I sat down and my mother was sitting next to me too. And so the tone of the speech that I was delivering was very important to me at a very personal level. Because when it was done, I wanted my mother to be able to say something more than, wow, he came down here to get that guy. So I sat down. And what I'm going to tell you, I mean, thousands of people saw it, so I'm not telling you anything that's a secret. If you've ever been to a city council meeting or ever been one when George was president, he always stood. He never sat down. I think he picked that up from the, uh, the head of the Congress, Speaker of the House. And uh, I sat down, and no one said a word. I mean, they, first of all, I think a lot of people were stunned that I gave that speech. And he started laughing. He didn't just start laughing. He laughed uncontrollably. And he, he never looked at the crowd. He just kept looking down at his desk. And then after he laughed for a little while, and nobody said a word, I think people might have started laughing too. He said, he said, Mike White kicked my ass. <laughs> I'm sorry, young people, but that's what he said. He said it twice. And people laughed, and now people were roaring. Uh, and I'm sitting there, I'm, I don't quite, I haven't quite figured out what was going on. And uh, when things died down, he stopped laughing. And he's, so he was doing the final wrap-up. 
he said, uh, I'm going to announce committee appointments next week for uh, the incoming council people as well as the uh, uh, ones who, who are coming back from election. He says, but I want to make one appointment now. He says, I hereby appoint Councilman Michael White to the Finance Committee. I was the first freshman to ever be appointed to the Finance Committee in the history of City Council. My speech to the Council and his appointment of me was the best way two people like us were ever going to say, let's put it behind us and move forward. And uh, it's interesting because his act and my act confirmed for me the kind of manner of conduct, the kind of person I wanted to be in public life. And so for a long time, he and I uh, were allies and uh, worked on a lot of projects together. Uh, and there came a time when his leadership was threatened and my job was to make sure that didn't happen, which I did. So that's my George Fourth story. <laughs>